All right, this is Mehdi and Angelina. We've covered a lot about different techniques for building rag systems, but today we're going to zoom out and explore some of the best practices at each stage of the journey. So if you're ever confused on when or how to use different rag techniques, this video is for you. We will also answer the question, can we pinpoint optimal rag practices? And we'll also share a very clear roadmap to guide you through what methods to use, when to use them, and the pros and cons of each of them. So stick around till the end. Let's dive in. All right. Today, we are going to talk about a very interesting research paper, which came out July 1st. So the title of the paper is Searching for Best Practices in RAG. Today, we are going just to talk about some of the experiments that they did in terms of best practices for RAG applications. So we all know that RAG implementation is hard, especially mm -hmm. in production. Unlike many who believe that RAG is the hello world of AI, implementing a RAG application in production is extremely hard. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you want to create a very simple demo chat to PDF locally and use it, it's not that difficult to do that. But if you want to implement a really rag system into production for your company or business, then that's a different beast. Uh, one of our friends who's a business owner, I remember she mentioned that, oh, we're building a rag system and I think it's so easy. I don't have to hire any engineers. A high schooler can build it for us. That's what she said. <laughs> so. Sure. Yeah, probably it's easy for her, but definitely it is, it is very difficult to do that. And that's why there are hundreds of papers recently talking about RAG and how to come up with different approaches to implement RAG. So many of the approaches that are out there, they are good approaches, but implementation is very complex if you want to implement them. And also we know that RAG workflow in, involves several different steps that I'll mention them shortly. And each step of this implementation involves a lot of other sub tasks, and there are so many techniques for each one of them. That's why it makes it very difficult and, and complex. So the question that this paper was trying to answer is, can we identify optimal RAG practices? Wait, this is the soul of this video, right? Yes. So they are introducing some best practices recommendation, but I would like to say that we don't necessarily need to go with all of the recommendations that they have done because this is based on their experiments and experiences, mm -hmm. but it's a good roadmap in my opinion. If you want to implement, you can just look at the approaches that they recommend. Um, so this picture here shows all different components and modules that they have experimented with, the authors of the paper. And we are going to cover all of these rectangles and boxes. We can make uh, videos for some of these if our audience is interested later. Absolutely. I think we have covered some of the concepts here in our previous videos, but if audience is interested in a specific technique or component, then they can let us know and we can absolutely create some videos for them. Yeah, let us know. Leave a comment. All right. So this is the approach that they have taken to experiment with different techniques for RAG. This is their workflow. What they have done is um, so they have selected up to three best performing methods for each step, and then they evaluated the impact of each method on the overall RAG performance by just testing one method at a time for each individual step while keeping the other RAG components and modules unchanged. Mm -hmm. So for example, if they wanted to test chunking, then they selected three chunking methods and then they just kept the other components unchanged and each of these three methods, they tested them and evaluated which one works better. And mm -hmm. then after that, they selected the best performing method and then used that for the next module. This is like a machine learning, a variable selection technique. It's like forward selection or something like that, right? Do you know how did they come up with the best performing methods to start with? Are, are those from recommended? So, yeah. Um, that's a good question. The thing is, there are necessarily somewhere mentioned these are the best approaches. However, there are some popular approaches for some modules and then they use them. As far as I remember, they didn't mention exactly how to pick up to three best performing methods for each yeah. module, the yeah. way that they selected the, the methods. All right. Now, if I come back here, I am going to start from this 
um, column on the right hand side. So chunking is the first module. We're going to talk about chunking and then embedding and vector databases. Okay. Sounds good. We're not going to cover in details, just explaining in a very high level. Mm -hmm. So you got to go and just read the paper. Homework. Homework. Yes. Chunking. We know that chunking is the first step. So what is chunking? When we're going to implement a rack system, we are dealing with a collection of documents. So typically we have to split and break these long documents into smaller pieces. So mm -hmm. that's called chunking. And one of the main reasons is that uh, the context window of the LLM cannot hold the entire documents. If we are dealing with thousands of documents and they're very long, then we cannot just put everything inside the context window of LLM. So we have to split that. There are many different techniques for that. There is token level chunking, which we just split the document or text at the token level. If you think about token as an equivalent of a word, token is usually less than a word, but think about it as words. So it's word level chunking. We split based on some number of words. That's the most straightforward way of doing that. So um, it's like a hundred tokens, 200 tokens. Something like that. Yes, 100 tokens or words, 200 words, things like that. So we have a large text. We just split it, cut it at that point. So each one of these 200 words or tokens is going to be one chunk. And we just repeat that for all the documents. We have another technique called semantic level chunking where we just chunk the documents based on the sentences or paragraphs that are semantically similar. Okay? This usually works better. However, it is time consuming because you need to essentially just go over each paragraph somehow and see which ones are semantically similar and then just put them together. So this is computationally expensive. We have also sentence level chunking where we just cut them based on the sentences. Mm -hmm. So this is another level. What they have realized that sentence level chunking work better in their experiment. Better in terms of uh, performance. Yes. Yeah. But again, it doesn't mean that we should always go with that. It all depends right. on the use case and all that. Right. Um, but at least if you don't know which approach to go, then you say, oh, I'm going to go with, let's say, sentence. Level. Yeah. And there's also cost and latency con considerations as well. Right. Yes. Et cetera. All right. right. So another part of the chunking is to identify what should be the size of a chunk. Right. And there are several different parameters involved. So when you want to decide about the size of the chunk, if you say that, oh, I'm going to just select a very small chunk, then what happens, then you're essentially fragmenting the sentences. Because if you say, for instance, each chunk has to be 30 tokens, right? Then that 30 token could be like a middle of a sentence. So cutting off and all that. Then you are missing of a lot of context because it's essentially, it's too short. So it doesn't probably have a lot of context with it. And if the chunk size is very large, then you will have a lot of noise in your chunk, irrelevant context. So when you are doing retrieval, then you'll end up with chunks that contain a lot of noise. So figuring out that something like a balance in between is very important. And typically it's more of a try and an error and evaluating, selecting a chunk size, then see if it works. And then you go with that. So finding the optimal chunk size involves a balance between different metrics. Usually the metrics is something that you define. Here, what they have done, they have considered two different met metrics. One is faithfulness and the other one is the relevancy. So faithfulness is um, whether the response is hallucinated or not, okay? And relevancy measures whether the retrieved text and responses are relevant to the user query. Is faithfulness and relevancy a trade-off? Because if you're more relevant, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're less faithful, right? Yes, it could be potentially, right? And these are all definitions that they have used. Mm. Um, yeah, um, it feels like precision and recall in a sense. Looking at it, they want both metrics to be high. So you can have a composite metric that factor in both sides. I mean, it's user-defined, right? Relevancy is definitely important. And faithfulness is another maybe just metric that they picked. And they want to optimize both metrics, something like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And they tried different chunk size here in the table. You can see that there is 2048, 1024, so on and so forth. 
So typically it's order of like two to the power of something. It doesn't have to be that way, but then you can see that 512 in terms of faithfulness work better and in terms of relevance, 256 tokens. This is interesting. If you look at the, the bigger chunk size, it seems like causing more hallucination because <laughs> the LM um, finding it hard to understand the long context. Yes. And the reason is that when the chunk size is very large, you're going to pass these chunks to the generator. So the generator has to use them to generate the response and the, the hallucination comes from there. Got it. Right? Yeah. So it's not in the retrieval part, but later on, right? Mm. Uh, it's going to impact. So that's why I don't want to go with a very large chunk size because mm -hmm. it adds noise, irrelevant context, and it's going to confuse the LLM later on, the generator. Well... For chunking, there are, again, a bunch of techniques. And one of the interesting ones is small to big. So in this technique, what happens is that smaller text chunks are going to be used during the retrieval process. And later on, when you want to pass the, the chunks into the LLM to generate the response, you're passing the larger chunks that these smaller chunks belong to. So for retrieval, usually smaller chunks work better in terms of accuracy, so you get more relevant things. But yet when you want to pass them to, to LLM, they may not have enough context, so that's why you just increase the size of the chunk when the LLM is going to generate a response. So it's called small to big. And sliding window is when you are splitting the document into chunks. Each chunk has overlap with some other chunks it's sliding. So this is the chunk. And then you slide your window and then this is another chunk. And just you keep doing it. But typically there is also some overlap with each chunk. That's called sliding window. So for the small chunks, they use 175 tokens. For larger chunks, they use five, uh, 512. And uh, so it seems like the sliding window where you just have the chunks and chunks have overlap, it tend to be working better in terms of the metrics. Then they went with the sliding window. Another module is vector databases, and there are plenty of vector databases to choose from. In this paper, they had different criteria. They said, okay, let's just see which vector database can we use, which gives us multiple index types. If you want to uh, embed images, tags, billion scale vector support, which one of them support hybrid search, and which one has the cloud native capabilities. And then they selected several different vector databases, including VV8, Face, ChromaDB, Quadrant, and MilVest. And again, these are more details of the capabilities, which one is flexible, scalable, ease of use, right? If you want to deploy something into production. So these were some of the criteria that they had in their mind. Yeah, I uh, just want to mention that uh, we also published a blog post about how to navigate vector search systems um, for your rack system uh, last week. And I'll share the link to the description of this video as well. Excellent. All right. What they have done, they chose Melvis because it checks all of the features that they wanted. Mm -hmm. In general, they are very similar. I have used all of these vector databases, uh, excluding uh, Melvis. I have used Quadrant, Chroma Face, VV8, LanceDB, and uh, a couple of others. I personally always go with Quadrant. That's my favorite. It's very easy to use, very fast, very easy to use API, and it has a lot of capabilities. So they even have a free tier if you want to use it. So far, we covered this three different modules here. Next time, we'll cover the rest of the diagram. Stay tuned till next time. Ciao.